Thank you for joining us for this session. Uh, my name is Arvind Jamwal. I am Business Development Manager at AWS. Uh, so this session is about how edtechs are pushing tech barriers to transform the way we learn. Uh, let me introduce my panelists here. Uh, so Ankit, if you may please introduce yourself to the audience. Sure. Hi, uh, I'm Ankit. Uh, I am the founder and CEO of Unstop. Uh, formerly, it was called Dare to Compete. Uh, what we do essentially, it's a community engagement and hiring platform. We we help companies uh, discover, engage, and hire the right talent across India beyond boundaries. And in the same manner, what we are enabling is we are enabling the unstoppable talent, which is anybody and everybody in India who who is doing any course to basically get an opportunity to be hired by their dream companies. And in typical way, we say that that is going beyond resumes as such. So the HRs won't go through your resume. They will only go through the skills. And we basically do that through our community engagement platform. Thank you, Ankit. Uh, Shubham, if I may please request you to introduce yourself. Hello, I am Shubham. Uh, I'm engineering. I am engineer as a back from a background. Uh, I, I'm representing practically we are bringing learning alive. So we offer solutions which are related to education in majorly into experiential learning. So we, produ we produce content related to augmented reality, virtual reality and whatnot. So I'm representing uh, practically here. Uh, coming to the content part, so we are uh, exploring several other fields as well, which we'll probably discuss in the get-go. Uh, that's pretty much it. Perfect. Thank you very much, Shubham. Mahesh, if I may please request you. Hi, my name is Mahesh. Um, I represent Career360. I'm the founder for that company. Uh, we essentially are helping students uh, discover the right college, right pathway, right courses for themselves. On a platform, we have about 36,000 colleges offering about 450,000 courses that uh, they offer for them. Uh, and we have all kinds of data that will help the student take a more informed career choice. Thank you, Mahesh. So before we get started, a quick question for the audience. How many of us here work with edX? OK, wonderful. Uh, how many of us here are in education industry but do not work with edtechs? OK, wonderful. And how many who are not with education industry but you work in some other industry verticals? OK. Oh, nice. So I, I think we have uh, quite a nice mix, edtechs plus non-edtechs. So it's going to be an interesting conversation. In fact, uh, we will also open for Q&A towards the end of the conversation. So feel free to ask your questions then. Uh, from edtechs, um, I think all of us know that they have been at the forefront of adopting technology when it comes to learning solutions, be it for students, be it for professionals, or even to how to engage this whole learning community as a whole. During the pandemic, we saw there was a mass adoption of all edtech solutions. There came a need for scalability almost overnight. And then there are rapid technology advancements happening in the various fields, be it AI, ML, be it virtual reality, artificial reality. I think even in the previous session, there were some questions around that. And now data lakes are coming in. And as we enter the post-pandemic situation, right, we are getting into the resuming the offline mode of education. This brings in a new dimension, how we interact with these learners, with this learner community. So I think with a lot of things happening, so let me start with you, Ankit. So how have these recent tech and ecosystem developments impacted your tech strategy? And please talk us through some of the areas and innovations that you're focusing on as an organization. Sure, sure. First of all, I, I've, I mean, if you see a journey of a student, correct? I'm just, uh, I'll take only one part of it, but uh, probably the other panelists will basically talk about the others because uh, Mahesh, uh, if you see from the journey, the, the, a student discovers in which college or school they want to study or which course they want to do, right? So that's the platform where you actually go and discover everything, correct? Now we have Shubham who basically is pre predominantly into learning, right? Because they are enabling teachers to basically have better learning when they are actually interacting with students, right? And at Unstop, what we do is that they start with A, B, and then the C comes, which is Unstop, where we are helping them build their resume or CV points through different opportunities on our platform. And we are also enabling them to get recognized and hired, right? And that's why I think if you see all these three separately before COVID, you, you would have been relying on your network, okay, to basically discover uh, the colleges that you want to go to, right? If you have, let's say, uh, 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 friends or uh, your, your family, right, 
wherever they have gone, right, you basically get to know only those aspects, correct? And it's limited to your own ecosystem, correct? Now, from the learning point of view, again, the teacher who is teaching you, you are actually limited to as to how they are teaching you and what knowledge do they have. In the hiring space where we are, we, you are only limited to the companies that are actually coming onto your campuses to sort of hire. Uh, the other thing was that from the CV point of view, let's say if I take an example of I'm Ahmedabad, right? Everybody who go, gets into I'm Ahmedabad is a 90 percentile. If you look at all their CVs, all 400 of them, right? They will only be very, very minute difference, difference, differentiation, right? And that is true in pretty much all colleges or all courses floating around, right? Earlier, if the requirement and pre-COVID from the tech angle and the non-tech angle as well, if the requirement was X, now companies are hiring three to four X, right? Because the economy is booming, the, the hiring is up. In that sense, they also, also need platforms like Unstop, which will help them go beyond their boundaries. And in a, in a, in a, in a same manner, the students are also able to get opportunities which they won't through their campus teams or so, right? Uh, there are two aspects to it, which we are solving and for which I think uh, companies are coming, coming to us. One is that, let's say if you are a, a female coder uh, in, a, in a tier three institute, you are actually good at coding, correct? But there is no company visiting in your campus, right? you basically take another six to nine months to find a good job and you may settle, I mean pre-COVID, you could have settled in for a job which you didn't like, correct? Now on Unstop, you can browse through various opportunities. So let's say Walmart wanted to have female coders. We opened up a hackathon, correct? What that did was that it eventually gave opportunity to about 50,000 girls to apply to Walmart, which they did, and they went through the all the rounds, all the different preliminary, pre, uh, preliminary rounds on Unstop and then finally Walmart was able to hire the best out of the lot, right? So uh, what used to happen in US where the companies were not going into the campuses, they used to select the best guys who have the skill sets to go beyond, right? Is now happening in India only because of COVID and the platforms like us are thriving, correct? So. Uh, the other parts, the other panelists can uh, sort of share. Yeah, so I think Shubham, uh, like Ankit pointed out that you come into the learning piece of it. How do you bring learning alive? So yeah, what's your take on this? Yeah. Sure. So, uh, uh, we, uh, so our audience target majorly has been only, uh, obviously the ed tech which has been in this range of class eight to class 12 majorly, which was our primary target. And then we started majorly with the course prep, uh, test prep as a solution initially which was a web solution to start with. And as soon as the mobile application penetration started, as soon as the geo and the internet penetration started, that reaches, it reached to a wider audience. So we created mobile application. We started our solutions in mobile offering majorly. Our solutions became mobile friendly, very intuitive to mobile. Mobile application was our primary focus at that time. Then as soon as the augmented reality and virtual reality became prominent, as soon as it got into the handheld device, it became very easy to access. It became very intuitive to use. So we started solutions which were majorly in augmented reality. And now in this age, as we are seeing based on the pandemic as the scale as the production scale up had to happen overnight so we scaled up our solutions to meet the requirements which we which were majorly mobile accessible accessibility users majorly and then now we are switching ourselves our gear up to uh, metaverse majorly where we are seeing that digital identities and different different cellulose will become one and you will find your one identity communicating with the same thing across so that's what we are getting to right now Got it. And uh, Shubham, if I may implore you more to talk more about Metaverse, you know, we hear a lot about it. So what is your approach to it and what do you see as, a, as an outcome of this Metaverse? So, right. so uh, Metaverse in general, uh, uh, what we have seen till now, Metaverse is majorly seen as a gaming uh, exploration majorly. That gaming, uh, ma majorly the gamers are the first one who are adopting to the Metaverse in general. What we have seen, what we have identified majorly is Metaverse is nothing but your digital identity. As let's say you are logging into Google, you have digital, digital identity which you are communicating to Google. Same Google as a login is available now on various websites. So your digital identity from Google becomes your authentication system. Going further, as soon as the 3D advent becomes very easy, your processing on your handheld device becomes so fast that you can render 3D simulations, 3D environments on your phone real time with, based on 5G 
or network penetration that will be very real, very, very close actually to happen. As soon as the AR glasses becomes very prominent, all your digital identity which are there will become very close to your reality. So you can actually augment the rest of the things which you want on your environment itself. And then, then it'll become, it becomes a amalgam amalgamation of some sort. So in general, metaverse people think of a more of a virtual reality point of view, and it's a, uh, like it's a cut-off experience. That's not the case. Uh, with metaverse in general, you can actually augment the real world, and you can actually have major utilities in the real world than in a cut-off experience. So we, with metaverse, we are trying to create such environment environment which gives you learning at the same time it creates one identity for you which you can communicate to other verses also perfect so Mahesh I'll come to you so how have you been addressing this that whole change in the ecosystems and given you come in where students just start exploring their learning journey yeah yeah so uh, I think the first thing that happened is uh, the student calendars that we got used to have completely been destroyed you know uh, earlier there was a clean calendar that March you would have an examination June you will have a result August, you start your new classes. Now, if you look at even Delhi for that matter, in the month of May 2022, the 10th class student hasn't passed because the board results haven't come. The 11th class student is sitting here, and he's, he's passed, right? And he's moved on to the 12th class. And the tw So basically, in one particular class, you actually had no student. In another class, you had two sets of students because the board results hadn't come. 10th class, has the results have not come. 11th, the results have come and so on and so forth, right? So if you now notice across the country, I'm just talking of Delhi, you know, someone is entering, who is a class 12 student? A st student who's passed out but is waiting for an admission into a UG program, or a student who's passed out of class 11th and entered class 12th? Because in class 12th, you had two sets of students, people who passed out, or uh, people who gave an examination but haven't passed out, and people who passed class 11th and got into class 12th. So the data integrity became a big problem. Because we serve students based on who the profile is, who they are, what they are, right? Now, if I were to send a mailer or uh, information, uh, information which is essential for class 12 students, it's being received by two sets of students because both in my system are tagged as class 12th. And this created a massive chaos and across the country it's much bigger a problem. So the first thing we had to r realize was, decide was, how much of data integrity can we bring in even at the cost of reducing the number of students who access us. So that, that's the first thing we did. And we did it a smart way uh, because of which, and in this, the most important thing is trust. If the student trusts that you're asking information from them because you want to serve them better, they'll pass it on. If, you, if they believe that you're asking them data to be sold in somewhere else, they would not. So the trust of the platform became very important. So I think education platforms have started investing in trust more than ever. That's the first part. The second thing is, uh, education is sealed in India, especially as only formal education, you know, when you get a degree or something. This COVID destroyed all those myths. You know, uh, you're no longer wanting to understand whether someone gives a formal qualification or not. Skilling became more important than in formal education. To, so, to that extent, people like us were forced to start creating information ecosystems for skilling programs and informal education also, which leads to the desired outcome, which is a job, right? And that uh, became a prominent thing. So now, for example, we, as I said, I, we cover 36,000 colleges and all. We cover 15,000 non-skilling program institutions, uh, which was unheard, say, two years back. And all these have sprouted over the last two years. Some of them will die if they don't give the desired outcome, as much as some of the formal education institutions will die if they don't give the desired outcome. And that's the best way to deal with this whole thing. So for us, these two things. And the third thing is, the, uh, there is a gradual shift of the student preferences to technology and health. So to that extent, I think core is suffering at, uh, in a certain sense. I hope we can reverse that trend somewhere along the line. But it, it, at this point in time, it looks like uh, you know, students are more uh, enamored by uh, you know, uh, technology-based education or, uh, uh, or health because there is a great prospect. And last, but uh, um, very important, uh, because all of us tech people love technology and we try to evangelize technology, uh, with all the uh, rush of blood that we all have of how technology has changed the face of education, trust me that the inequity because of technology has only increased during COVID times. And that, as a society, we must have empathy towards because people who don't have access to mobile phones, people who don't have access to computer systems and all, have been sitting at home for the last two years not studying anything. And to that extent, inequity has only increased and not reduced. 
Well, that's a very interesting point you make, uh, Mahesh, both in terms of data and data trustworthiness, uh, the relevance of data, and the increasing in inequity. Um, so let me ask my next question to you, right? So while working with data, it's, 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 uh, data is the new oil, as a lot of organizations have said it, right? So what has been an impact for your end user experience for this? And, and how did you know, AWS fit into all this equation? The first thing we did was we started collecting the intent of the student, not just data. So it's not just about, uh, so we created, earlier we were just collecting basic registration and we would assume that a student who's coming from JE examination page is looking for engineering as an option. Now we no longer go that. We actually ask him, are you looking for JE kind of a thing. So we, wa we are now collecting more of the intent of the student. And that's very crucial because otherwise, you know, you start sending communication to them, you will get into a spam mode, you will not, the uh, open rates fall, fall apart, and it creates a different problem for the domain authority of our entire structure, right? So, so the first thing is that uh, we said that we need to start capturing the intent of the student. And for that, you need to have trust. You know, if the student doesn't trust you, then he doesn't give you all the trade. So we created a platform called a discovery platform. So you take Google, for example. Google geotargeting is wrongly placed for a country like India. I'll tell you why. You know, I'm sitting in Bihar, and a Google, you know, geotargeting would allow a student of Bihar to see, you know, clients in Bihar, right? But the Bihar student wants to study in Delhi. Now what? So what we did was we started collecting. When I say intent, I said, okay, okay, the first question I ask is, you are a science stream student, a STEM student. These are the degrees that you can pursue, B.Tech, B.Sc, B.B.A., Law. I'll list out everything based on, on a counseling experience and based on what ex ex actually they can do. And so you can do the following courses, degrees, which one would you want to do? The student will do multi-select at times, right? Then we say, okay, you want to do B.Tech, these are the top 10 examinations that you must appear for. Which exam would you want to appear? The flow was as if it's a counselor. Then we go on to say, okay, these are the national uh, institutions. Would you prefer any one of these things? Then we say, okay, tell us which state would you want to prefer in, study in. And then we say, these are top 20 colleges in the state based on government of India ranking, because there's an NIRF ranking out there. The idea is to keep feeding them information which is credible, which is authentic, and not pushing or selling anything to the student. In the process, the student was learning every step that, okay, I'm a STEM student, I can do the following degrees, not just B.Tech, which is, or, or B.Sc. that is in the student's mind. He can also do law, he can do also B.B.A., and so on and so forth. So it became a counseling flow for us. And the counseling flow, trust me, initially we were worried, you know, we had actually had a four-field registration form earlier. We created it into a, almost a seven-field registration form, and then followed by a discovery platform, right? The discovery platform had almost 60% people, students filling in through the whole thing because they start trusting that these people are informing more, so I need to go to the next step and the following step and the following step. Because every step of the way, we're giving them so much, so much of information that possibly they knew or possibly they didn't know, or possibly we added a bit more information to what they already know. And the counseling flow is what we created, and that counseling flow ensured that the students started trusting us and giving us more information, because of which, for sure, our revenues increased. But more importantly, we started serving the student better. So I'll give you a simple example that, you know, today, when I say MBA aspirant, you actually have a student who is looking for MBA two years hence, one year hence, or a current student. Or a student who is looking for admission in 22, even now, and not just 23. Now, Today, when I look at the data integrity, I say almost half the students should not get any admission notification from me because they're not looking for admission in the current cycle. Earlier days, two years back, all the 100 would get it. Now only 50 will get it. And that's what is the big difference that happened. And it actually helped us sanitize our data structures, inform the student better, engage the student better. Our open rates went up, shot up, because we are only sending relevant information. So all those things happened, all forced on us by COVID. Otherwise, maybe we would never be, think, never be thinking on, on these lines. And so I, I'll jump to you, Anket, on this in terms of also touching a bit on the equity or inequity and uh, you as a platform enabling, uh, let's say, a student in a tier three country go for her dream job or his dream job. Uh, so, you know, what has been the actual impact on your end user experience as you scale this up, right? And what role did technology play in all that? And AWS. <laughs> So uh, I'll, I'll start from uh, the basics, right? So I was, uh, for three years, I was with Teach for India. 
which is an NGO which eradicates education inequity, right? There I worked with, uh, I mean, Teach for America, Teach for uh, All, and I realized that this inequity that exists in the education is not only with respect to India, right? Though the scale may change, but every country on earth, and trust me, every country on earth has inequity in education, right? Now, what we are trying to do is, uh, and I mean, from the, from the learning and the education perspective, there are ed tech players who are enabling teachers, there are uh, companies who are enabling you to do your uh, professional degree programs without even going to the campuses or colleges, right? We are solving a different kind of inequity, which is accessible to opportunities, right? Uh, because what happens is that the more you uh, participate or apply in different opportunities, the more you learn, and then only you'll be able to crack. Very, very few, I mean, for, for me, right? When I was uh, right after my engineering, right? It took me 10 interviews to crack my job. And I'm sure that would be the case with pretty much all of us, right? Or very few of us would have cracked our first job interview, correct? Similarly, what we are enabling them is that, hey, you have multiple opportunities to participate. You may not win those opportunities or you may not be able to excel in those opportunities, right? But if you're able to at least participate or maybe go to a level where you're in the finalist, you will be able to create that CV point, correct? And then eventually you will learn and eventually you will basically be recognized and you'll be hired. Or for that matter, you, you um, mostly might be able to create your own startup because your idea was recognized by one of the jury members. It, it's very, very different, right? And when I talk about these opportunities, right, let me also say that these opportunities are not only related to hiring. So these opportunities are where, let's say, if you're good at design, there are innovation challenges that are happening on Unstop, where you can actually show to the likes of uh, Hero, we are just launching innovation challenges with, with uh, NPCI, where uh, uh, similar to UPI, can you create a different payment method, right? And if, if your idea is selected, possibly NPCI may implement that, correct? There are multiple things that we are uh, sort of uh, looking into. Uh, then uh, there are uh, aspects of the technology which is enabling this. Now, uh, imagine on, on Unstop, there are 3.6 million users, students as well as early working professionals, right? Uh, there are close to about 20,000 such opportunities listed in a matter of a year, correct? The main problem is how do I map which student, which opportunity, right? Or we let student decide, they browse through all the opportunities or so, right? Now, what, with, what we have done is and with, uh, let's say, limited resources or a lean team, a startup needs to rely on partners like AWS, and I'll give you a scenario which basically created wonders for us. So there are two use cases. Uh, one was that, uh, let's say, if a user is hopping on to Unstop, there are numerous opportunities that got live in last three to four days, right? Imagine three million users coming onto a platform the home page it's same correct every everybody sees the same thing the the data we already have as to whether this person is a female male to that point we also know whether that person is let's say lgbtq which course which year pass out and all right can we curate some opportunities a newsletter or a recommendation system which is not only relevant to your background as per your profile but also is relevant to your interests, right? And those interests would be based on what kind of a pages have you view, viewed earlier? What kind of opportunities have you basically registered, right? And trust me, this is not a simple algorithm. For all the coders, this is not a simple algorithm. This 3.6 million users might be divided into close to 100,000 clusters, right? And those clusters will have to be given uh, recommendations. It's a, it's a similar model as uh, Netflix recommendation. If all of us open up Netflix, all of us will get different recommendations, right? A similar uh, service was launched by AWS, which is called Personalize, right? We tried using it because, I mean, we can't create an AI engine from scratch, correct? It takes uh, 
labor resources it takes money it takes time right if uh, somebody who is known to that industry creates an api and we start leveraging that api our go to market time reduces and trust me that happened our go to market time for this feature reduced to only 2 weeks and within 2 weeks if we were sending let's say 3.6 lakh emails on a daily basis to all these users with a generic newsletter and we were getting let's say maybe 100000 traffic in terms of the clicks or so we are still sending 3.6 lakh newsletters but those are contextualized and personalized for every user and that led to that 100k traffic increase 5x to 500k right we didn't do anything the the money is same we had a huge go to market time and the registrations on the on the platform or the community on the platform increased a second use case uh, is that on our platform when companies are launching uh, these opportunities because we are a community of millions there are few thousand students who register right so let me give an example of let's say walmart where 51000 girls registered of flipkart where 1.6 lakhs engineering students registered right now if they are going through it the onus is of uh, ensuring that the assessments are happening in a proctored and a full proof manner is on us right there uh, we have leveraged few technologies like face recognition video recognition and all which again the base wasn't created by us right we leveraged on few of the existing apis because i personally believe that uh, if you have those apis don't create your own system first test the market and then if aws is expensive then try and build it in house that's our model and that's what we have been going forward with right but what what that did was that that reduced the chances of that uh, a different person taking an assessment to less than 0.01% and how did that happen at the time of registration your face is tracked right if you are coming on to the assessment your face is verified that hey this is the same person who's who registered maybe days earlier now during the assessment as well the face uh, tracks whether it is the same person and now we are going one level up where we are uh, integrating with the data that government has right aadhar data to check whether the person who is registering is really ankit agarwal or not right and that basically ensures that we are actually partnering with the whole ecosystem using the data of pretty much anybody and everybody and using the best in class technology to reduce the go to market time and to use uh, uh, the features meaningfully yeah. no thank you ankit and uh, shubham heading to you in for the same question and given uh, ar we are still you know in in fancy still evolving so how how has been your users responding to it any early successes you are seeing and any challenges you might have faced from a technology front as well if you could. sure so uh, so uh, while we were uh, while we were developing our application in in while we were in that phase we actually found that the search in general while you are searching for any query the students in general they are asking queries which they want a manual solutions to which be for which we launched seek help which is one on one questioning you can ask questions you can resolve those but we also found while the pandemic was ongoing they wanted queries which are search related so if you take an example let's say google pixel you can take a picture you can take uh, get to know about it you can get to know what is this social graph you can get to know what products are related but coming to the education this is uh, like uh, google pixel is very wide open so we created a solution which is called scan anything where you can scan any previous exam question paper you can scan any object around you and it will give you a tree graph around it where you can learn tap on points and go drill down around it and go into the details that was one of the prominent features which we while we launched it was very like liked by the students and the retention for our application based on that feature itself jumped to 131% based on this itself where in this one again in the scan anything again we used amazon's um, ai tools which is i guess uh, i'm forgetting the name but i guess uh canvas is also we used for the video exploration part which gives us analytics we created our own own ost solutions then coming to the metaverse part now we are working closely with amazon uh, while we are working on the architecture part majorly while we are working along with the team itself not only for the solution part but also the different audience so while cause we our solution target is actually our audience target is varied we have ar solution we have virtual reality solution we have mobile application web application so we wanted a testing suit which can actually accommodate for all these so we used amazon's uh, device farm for uh, validating all these and again all these tools uh, is not just for the free credits but to explore and get to the value to the users also so that's what we consume
No, no, absolutely. And 131% uh, is a fantastic retention rate. I think uh, this is something which is much chased after in yeah. the world of ethics today. So I'll, I'll start with my next question with you, Shubham. I mean, given you've seen some early successes, right? So where do you go from here? What are some of the upcoming trends that you see maybe in metaverse or ed tech in general? So uh, any thoughts on that? Right. So, um, so um, uh, prominently, we were very active into augmented reality, virtual reality space in general, where we wanted our solutions to be available for everyone, not only device, uh, not only device specific, unless you are not supporting any Google APIs which can accommodate your 3D rendering, you don't have engines which can render, which can get the depth sensor. We actually did it based on the image itself. So we understood the image depth, then we rendered few things which are not static, which are not explorable in 3D, 6D UF, which is like you can rotate around the object, which was 3D UF. You can actually uh, interact with the object you can zoom in, and um, you can actually de see the details around it. So the augmented reality as a solution we uh, launched in our application around in 2018. And that was one of the exploratory feature. We wanted to know from the audience like how is the experience. And the UX at the time was very poor. For us, to enable, for us to educate the users that you need to scan the plane, then you need to tap on it, became very lengthy for us. So, because uh, it was very, uh, like early at that time, we could not understood the market, we could not tell, like how do we train these users. After that, Snapchat, Instagram filters, all these things came up, which has face filters, you have depth filters, you, now users understand where to tap, how to tap. So now, like, cause we have uh, such a young audience in our application, now those people are very, like they are very, under, like they understood very early and they are actually exploring most of the features. They have actually asked for several other features, different location-based tagging also they have requested, several feature requests we have got. So now at this stage where we are in right now with the augmented reality in general, we are exploring with the mobile front. We were actually very much active into virtual reality space as well where we set up several VR labs, uh, which has like entire uh, experiment set up. You can perform all experiments in a classroom. You can, uh, you can engage with the classroom. Now what we are seeing is a uh, merge of these two. AR and VR, which is extended reality in general. We are uh, in metaverse itself. We are, uh, we are actually uh, exploring in this front right now, but we have already validated with AR and VR. So metaverse in general is the thing where we are headed to. And in metaverse, we are again uh, bringing value rather than a gaming element to it. No, fantastic. So I'll, I'll head to you next, Mahesh. I mean, uh, you have a data strategy in place. Uh, you have changed the way you're reaching out to your uh, students. And you change the way how you are helping students for the betterment of, of what their career aspirations are. So where do you head from here? Any any trends? Any any new plans? Yeah, I think uh, I think we need to. First, uh, right now, we are working on something where we will be able to uh, handhold the student through the student journey because students comes in maybe in class eighth, and then we need to ensure that we travel with the student uh, and be with the student at every step of the way, right? And that would be a massive challenge, but a massive opportunity also. Um, because you don't acquire students every single year. You need to travel with the students. So that's one thing. So And from there, we are trying to create an e-counselor which would handle the student at every step of the way, where the student can pull in what he wants, you know, delete what he doesn't want and all, so that we know what the student is looking for, what the student is searching for, or what the student is accessing from our own platform. Because see, the platform is large for us. It, uh, we get about 450 million plus sessions on the platform every year. Uh, every year we get about 7 million registrations. So if I just go back to the last three years itself, we were talking about 20 million plus registrations. And it's only increasing by the day. And uh, all these are unique students. Uh, now, unless we ca uh, travel with the student in the student journey, uh, it will create a bottleneck for the student as well as us. So that's the biggest challenge that we're taking up. And assuming we crack that challenge, uh, I think, uh, We've done a very good service to the society. No, no absolutely, Mahesh. And uh, coming to you, Ankit, from Mahesh preparing the students to take the next. Anyway, I just want to add to what Ankit yeah, says. Yeah, sure. Uh, I think what Ankit is doing is brilliant. Uh, you know, I've always talked of democratization. Like uh, uh, when Careers was launched, it was long with Dr. Manmohan Singh, and uh, I remember those days when he was fighting a battle and he said, "Can you can Kapil Sibal launch it?" I said, "I want you to launch it because education is one place where a person." working as a maid in your home can say, I'll become bigger than the boss. Because you believe in education. The power of education is very, very democratic, right? And it's the biggest tool of empowerment for a country like India. And access and equity is something that I'm always worried about, because why should only 1,000 colleges which get tie up with TCS get placement from TCS? It's a challenge that I've always asked TCS, and now they created an examination, right? So what Ankit is doing is essentially that. It is ensuring that an IIM Ahmedabad student can compete with a school in college in Chirala in Andhra Pradesh and have an equal opportunity and equal fair hearing. And the more such 
platforms come in, uh, I think we'll be a more just society. Absolutely, and uh, this brings to the democratization we were talking prior to this panel. So Ankit, uh, uh, again, you have changed the way you approach, you, you're using AML now, trying to scale, uh, reducing the time to market for you. So now, what next from here, right? So where are you headed, any new trends that you see? I mean, I think we are just getting started. Uh, I, I see ourselves on just uh, at the tip of the iceberg. Uh, at Unstop, uh, what I want to do is that uh, I want to connect the world's community on a single platform, right? Right now as well, if I mean, I'm sure all of you would have LinkedIn accounts, right? Uh, on LinkedIn as well, when you create your account or when you're browsing through your feed or through, let's say, jobs or so, predominantly you only look at opportunities maybe within your country, right, the India. Now, the example that I have showcased to you, right, can the app, Apple and the Teslas of the world can come on to the platforms like Unstop and engage with anybody and everybody across the world and possibly look at not only engaging, uh, recognizing them, but possibly hiring them as well uh, within a matter of days, right? That's the eventual aim that we are uh, looking forward to. And on the, on the flip side, what we are also looking at is how do students get those access and opportunities? Again, not for the, for, the, for the hiring, right? Many a times, few students also wants to uh, practically implement things that they learn in campuses or through their uh, teachers. Uh, the project uh, initiated approach, right? So what we are also looking at right now is that can the big companies or even the small companies, if they have a problem statement, we call it innovation challenges, right? If they have a so small problems that they are facing internally or maybe just thinking through it, can they push that problem statement up for the platforms like us and have crowdsourced ideas? They may not be, pro uh, I mean, uh, deployment ready or product ready, but they may give those bigger companies food for thought or maybe the direction to think through. So I think the use cases, as we go broader, the technology I don't think will change. The use cases will be adopted based on the, the customer as well as the user, and we will continue to base, make changes to the technology to suit all those use cases. Fantastic. So uh, that brings us towards the closing segment of the session. Uh, we'll open up for Q&A. We can take probably two or three questions. If anybody, yeah, can, can we have uh, a mic over there, please? Uh, Ma'am, if you can please raise your hand again. Yeah, thank you. This question is actually for uh, Mr. Ankit Agarwal. Um, I know you mentioned that you started to use the personalized service of AWS and that showed you a significant increase in the number of registrations and the number of people who were actually signing up. From a follow through perspective, what increase did you see in terms of the number of people using your application actually getting, and placed, getting placed in the jobs that they were probably good for because of that? I mean, obviously, there's a factor of you've already had an increase, so the percentage would increase. But did you see anything from that perspective? So, OK, let me answer that question in a different manner, right? So let's say if there are 100 companies, right? They have close to 100 positions, correct? Now, their positions won't change. So uh, for, for me, I think the best metric to basically see is that how many users are getting more opportunities and are registering in more opportunities. Effectively, if Flipkart wants to hire 100, they will hire 100, correct? And 100 will be hired through my platform. If the funnel was 1,000 to 100, am I making 10,000 to 100 or a lakh to 100? At least, am I providing more opportunities to the students and are they picking it up, right? And that's what those implementation showed us. So if I basically talk about numbers, quarter on quarter, last year, if the average participation in those opportunities were close to 1,000, now, uh, in this quarter, that has pumped up to 1,500, which is 50% increase only in a matter of a quarter, right? And we want this to scale up 
as much as possible through technology so that nobody can say that, hey, we didn't get an opportunity to showcase our skills. That's the point. Thank you. Uh, any other questions? Yeah. Can we have Mike here, please? In the front row. So can you please raise your hand again? Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much for insightful session. Sir, you talked about reality to AR to VR, then a reality again. So what kind of difference you see from first R to last R? As in, uh, from reality to reality. As yes. Pro reality, augmented reality, virtual reality, then right. second reality. Right. So what kind of difference in experiences you feel from R1 to last R? Right. So from experiences wise, like AR in general is a... General everything. Ha, right. So uh, in experiences Ex wise... Experiences, practical uh, applicabilities, right. and uh, end result. Correct. So uh, what we, like in our application, what we have built, we have two layers. We have augmented reality layer and virtual reality layer. The AR layer, what we have used is to augment in the actual scenario. For example, let's say you are in this uh, room right now. You can scan, let's say, this board. You can understand who is the brand, how it was created. You can understand whatever around you is. So you can use that, you can use augmented reality for it. Our virtual reality solutions are majorly planned for a cutoff experience, which means you can perform entire experience. Let's say you can perform, you can see uh, uh, in our metaverse, we are creating a zoo, which is an extinct animal zoo. So you can actually see the animals, the uh, like the mammoths and whatever was there uh, pre in the ISO age era, era, whatever was there, you can actually see it in the virtual reality experience. Because you cannot see it in the real reality, you can actually, you need to cut off from here and you can need to be teleported to another scenario, which is virtual reality. That's a virtual reality solution. What we are at right now, we are actually in a, uh, the solution which will be uh, which will be most prevailed will not be virtual reality in general or augmented reality for that matter. It will be an extended reality, which will which means like you will have smart glasses enough who can render. Let's say in this scenario itself, we can render different content. You can get your emails on your phone, on your glasses itself. You can render different virtual environments here. You can play games also here. So in general, the reality in general will become an extension of reality rather than being a cutoff, which is a VR or AR at this moment. Is that, does that answer? Uh, there is uh, there is no less level of reality. This this will be extended. That's all. We'll enhance it. We'll actually add add to it. We'll create different widgets, different different uh, finickies, which can actually add more to this reality. There will not be like we for sure. This will be real. Correct. Never. You can uh, you can never get five senses imputation. Okay. Sorry, we are out of time. I'll just okay. Please go ahead. We'll take one last question. Yeah. Uh, hi, Ankit sir. Uh, actually, you told that you uh, on England there will be helping students for project purpose. So, how students will get help for project on LinkedIn? How you are helping? I'll give you Not an example. for the deployment purpose. You are saying for initial purpose, purpose right? No. So it's it's all about. Uh, I mean, implementing what you have learned during your academics for a real life business case. And I'll give you an example. Uh, not for the technology part of it, but uh, Hero Motocop, okay? Uh, they launched a challenge called as Innovation Challenge, okay? There were two parts to uh, the challenge. One was a design challenge where they wanted uh, graphic designs of their bikes, right? Uh, the things that are printed on the bikes, right? To be outsourced to as many uh, users as possible because they wanted as many ideas or as many designs as possible, right? On the second side, they also wanted an app for the techies. Uh, what kind of an app will make sense for a biker? Okay, what parameters should that app track? Correct? Can that track, let's say, your temperatures in your helmet? Okay, or uh, maybe the maintenance of your bike or so. Correct? The eventually for the design challenge. There were close to about 10,000 students that participated. There were about 500 submissions or so. The, the person who won, correct, his design currently is being used uh, in Hero Motocorp bikes. And they are selling 1 lakh bikes per month of that design, which was outsourced through an innovation challenge, not by their internal team. Right? And similarly, what I'm, what I'm saying is then it, it would have costed them, uh, so they, I mean, if you, if you do it internally, there is a longer cycle that you get into, right? 
if you basically do these these through the outs uh, crowdsourcing or the innovation ideas or so you get it in a lesser time right you will have to eventually uh, roll out top 3 or 4 offers or so and then your team gets a validation that hey everybody has like this now let's go ahead and implement it okay perfect thank you very much ankit and uh, sorry guys we're out of time uh, but if you still have any questions uh, our panelists will be outside for another 5 to 10 minutes please feel free to uh, meet them talk to them and understand more about their perspectives and uh, thank you very much for to our panelists for such an insightful discussion i